This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about regular local rings. So um, just to set up notation, R will be a notarian local ring and M is its maximal ideal. And there are several properties of local rings. Um, um, the one we're going to talk about today are regular, is regular rings. And um, there's a sort of nested family of properties that sort of go as follows. So um, slightly more general class of local rings are local complete intersection. And local complete intersection rings are themselves um, a special case of Gorenstein rings. Um, Gorenstein rings are a special case of Cohen Macaulay rings, and Cohen Macaulay rings are a special case of general local rings. So what we're going to do over the next few lectures is give some examples of each of these sorts of ring and explain why they might be interesting. So very informally, regular local rings are the ones that correspond to non-singular points of manifolds or varieties. So you remember local ring tells you something about an algebraic variety near a point. So these correspond to saying the point is non-singular. Local complete intersection is corresponds roughly to saying that your variety is defined by the minimum possible number of, of equations. Gorenstein rings are those that have nice duality properties. Um, Cohen-Macaulay rings are something to do with not mixing bits of different dimension. For instance, a typical example of a ring that isn't Cohen-Macaulay is, is a sort of a union of a line and a plane where you're mixing things of two different dimensions. And finally, we have general local rings. Um, so so um, this lecture is going to be about the, the, the best possible ones, which are regular ones. So let's first define regular local rings. So we recall that if we've got a local ring with maximal ideal m, then the, then the dimension of m over m squared is greater than or equal to the dimension of the local ring r. Here this is um, the dimension as a vector space over um, R, the field R over M, and this is its dimension in the sense of local ring theory, that's Kroll dimension or whatever. Um, and that's because um, the, the reason this inequality holds is that a set of generators for M is a system of parameters. And any system of parameters has cardinality at least the dimension of the ring R. And the ring is regular <coughs> if equality holds. So the dimension of M over M squared is equal to the dimension of R. So let's have a few examples of this. Um, so the first example, let's just take the ring kxy over y squared minus x cubed. So this is the coordinate ring of <coughs> a cusp, y, which is y squared equals x squared cubed. And we're going to localize at the origin, in other words, at the ideal xy. So at this point here, and you can see the variety is obviously singular at this point in some sense. It's, not, it's no longer a smooth manifold at the origin. Um, and if we look at the local ring, so if we localise this at, at the ideal xy, we see that the maximal ideal is the ideal xy, um, and um, m modulo m squared has dimension 2, um, because uh, neither x nor y are killed off by by um, this polynomial or by the ideal. On the other hand, um, if r is this local ring, the dimension of r is just equal to 1. 
and you see that so the dimension of the cotangent space is bigger than the dimension of the ring and um, this means the ring is not regular and this corresponds to the fact this point here is, is kind of singular. So that's a, that's a local ring that isn't regular. Um, now let's see some examples of local rings that are regular. Um, first of all, let's take R to be just, say, a power series ring in n variables. So that's a local ring. The maximal ideal is x1 up to xn. And we can see that m over m squared has dimension n because it has a basis x1 up to xn. Um, well, now we need to figure out what is the dimension of the ring R. And the easy way to figure this out is to remember that if we quotient out by an element xn, which is not a unit or a zero divisor, then the dimension of R over x, the ideal xn, is the dimension of R minus 1. Now, the ring R over xn is just equal to the power series ring in x1 up to xn minus 1. So every time you add a variable, um, you just increase the dimension by 1. So it's pretty obvious now that the dimension of R is just equal to n. So we see that in this case the dimension of the ring R is equal to the dimension of its cotangent space, so R is regular. Um, you can also see that the um, dimension of the localization of the polynomial ring, so suppose we localize this at the ideal x1 up to xn, in other words, we're sort of looking at the local ring at a point, is also regular. That's because its completion is the power series ring, and a ring has the same dimension as its completion, and it has the same cotangent space as its completion. So if the completion of a ring is reg local ring is regular, then the ring is regular. Um, now we say a ring R, which is not necessarily a local ring, so let's take any ring S is called regular if all the localizations of S at prime ideals P are regular. In fact, it's sufficient to do um, all maximal ideals P because Sayer proved that the um, localization of any regular local ring is also regular. So um, and the localization of um, S at some non-maximal ideal you can get by first of all taking the localization of the maximal ideal and then localizing that. So by Sayer's theorem, this is just regular. So um, we see that the ring of polynomials in n variables is a regular ring. And that's because if you take the localization of this at a maximal ideal, it's isomorphic to this ring here, which is regular. Um, and that's just as well because this is the coordinate ring of n-dimensional affine space and n-dimensional affine space obviously ought to be non-singular under any reasonable definition of non-singular. So, so, so um, this shows that our definition of regular ring does at least seem to be behaving in a reasonable way. It, it is giving you the um, non-singular points of an algebraic variety. Um, so, um, now, now we, we can ask, what do regular rings look like? Well, it's, you can't really say what a general regular ring looks like, but we can say quite a lot about complete regular rings, or rather regular local rings. Um, so, suppose R is... Um, R is a complete regular local ring. Now we're going to do, suppose that R contains a field um, mapping isomorphically to the field R over M. For example, if we take a, a, a ring of power series 
then this obviously contains a field mapping to r over m which is k. And you might ask, well, how can it not contain such a field? Well, here's an example when it doesn't. If we take the ring of p-adic integers, which is the completion of z at the prime p, then this is a complete regular local ring. But it doesn't actually contain a field um, mapping onto the quotient field, which is the finite field of order p. So some complete regular local rings contain a field isomorphic to the, to the field of quotients, and some don't. Well, now we're going to say, suppose it does. Then R is isomorphic to a power series ring, k x1 up to xn for some n. Um, and the proof of this is fairly easy. What we do is we pick x1 up to xn to be a basis for m over m squared. And then we get a map, we get a homomorphism from the ring of power series x1 up to xn onto our ring R. Here, here this is any complete um, notarian local ring. So, so far we haven't used the fact that R is regular, and all we've done is we've got a map from the power series ring on, onto R. Well, now we suppose that R is regular. What we want to do is show that this is injective. So if R is regular, this implies this map is injective. Well, suppose A is in the kernel. Um, then a is not a unit or a, or a zero divisor, so k um, x1 up to xn over a has dimension n minus 1. Um, so the ring R has dimension at most n minus 1, but this gives you a contradiction because the cotangent space of R is has dimension n and r is regular. So, so m over m squared has dimension n and r is regular, so, so these two numbers would have to be equal, which isn't possible if, if, there's, if there's something in the kernel. So this map here is actually an isomorphism. So we found all the complete regular local rings with a field mapping onto their quotient field. Um, this is actually a special case of the Cohen structure theorem for complete regular local rings, which describes more generally what happens if the ring R doesn't contain a field. And then, as you can see by looking at the p-adic integers, things get kind of a bit more complicated. You, you need a discrete valuation ring appearing in the, in the conclusion. Um, so let's have a look at some more examples. What about... Suppose you take a hypersurface fx1 xn in n-dimensional affine space. So, so here we're just looking at some sort of surface given by the space f equals zero. And we can ask which points have regular local rings. So um, if you think of the zeros as being some sort of space, we're asking which points of this space are non-singular, whatever non-singular means. Well, what non-singular means is that the local ring is regular because that's the definition of non-singular. But anyway, um, so um, what we've got, we may, as, we may as well look at the point 0, 0, 0, just to simplify notation, because we can change to that point just by changing coordinates. So first of all, we've got to ask, what is the dimension of the local ring where we take k, x1, up to xn, um, we quotient out by f, and we um, so we, we, we localise at zero, which means we localise it the, the ideal x1 up to xn. Well, we know the dimension of the local ring of k 
x1 up to xn is n because we worked this out earlier. And now we know that f is not a unit or a zero divisor. Well, it's not a zero divisor because this ring is an integral domain and it's not a unit because we should have said it's not a unit. So f is not a unit. If it is a unit, the, then this space is empty and it's a bit of a pointless working out its dimension. So the dimension of k x1 up to xn, uh, let's take the local ring and then quotient out by f, is n minus 1. It's not terribly surprising. This is just saying a, um, a hypersurface in n-dimensional space has dimension n minus 1, as it ought to. Um, so next we need to work out what is the dimension of the local ring. Sorry, the dimension of the cotangent space m over m squared. So let's work out m over m squared for the um, kx1 up to xn localised at the origin. Well, this is obviously just, we're going to take the space, the ideal generated by x1 up to xn, and quotient out by all products of the form xi, xj, which gives you m squared. And this is just an n-dimensional vector space spanned by x1 up to xn. So that, that, that's the cotangent space of affine space. Now we need to look at the cotangent space of the hypersurface. And for this we just take x1, the ideal x1 up to xn, and now we have to quotient out by all these numbers x i x j, and we also have to quotient out by um, f. So what we're doing is we're taking the vector space generated by x1 up to xn, and we're quotienting out by the linear part of f. And now we can see that this has dimension is given by n if f has no linear part, and it's given by n minus 1 if f has a linear part. And f has um, a linear part if and only if one of its first partial derivatives at zero is non-zero. So we see that the dimension of a local ring of the hypersurface f equals zero at a point is, sorry, the dimension of, not the local ring, the cotangent space is either n or n minus 1, depending on whether some partial derivative of f is non-zero. So it's n minus 1 if some partial derivative is non-zero and n otherwise. So, so this tells us um, what the singular points of a curve are. They're exactly the points where all partial derivatives of f and f also vanish. For instance, if f is y squared minus x cubed, the singular points are those satisfying the following equations. First of all, we must have y squared equals minus x cubed equals zero, because obviously the singular point of a curve must actually lie on the curve. And then we must have 2y equals zero and 3x squared equals zero. And at least in characteristic zero, you see this implies x equals y equals zero. So the singular point is exactly the origin, which is what our geometric intuition would tell us, because it's the only point that looks kind of um, a bit funny. Um, so um, what we'll do next lecture is give some more examples of um, local rings that are or aren't regular.